you to turn in God's Word to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. If you'd like to use the Pew Bible, it's found on page 836. Uh, words will also be provided for you on the screen. I would encourage you to have your own copy of God's Word as we, uh, as we continue our study through the book of Mark. And if you found your place there, I'd like to pray, pray briefly if you would do that with me, please. Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. We pray, O Heavenly Father, that you would take your truth and plant it deep in us, that you would shape and fashion us in your likeness, and for Christ's sake I pray, amen. Mark chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 35 through 45. Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 35. And rising very early in the morning, while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on to the next towns, that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And he went throughout all of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded, for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it and to spread the news so that Jesus could no longer openly enter town, but was out in desolate places. And people were coming to him from every quarter. This is the word of our living God. We are enjoying our study through the book of Mark. We come to these concluding verses, and we've said before that Mark is more about Jesus' doings rather than his sayings. You see a lot of action uh, signified by the word immediate as Jesus is uh, doing many, many things. And it's a reminder of what John says to us in the 21st chapter of his gospel. Now, there are many other things that Jesus did, were every one of them to be written. I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. So, beginning in verse 21, we just have one life of Jesus where, where many, many people were healed, thousands upon thousands. And here we come to understand and we have to realize the purpose for his miracles. It was to validate that he was truly who he said he was. It was to validate what John the Baptist had declared, that, that he was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. To validate that he was truly the Son of God, as the Father declared and the Holy Spirit declared at his baptism. And each miracle demonstrated his supernatural authority over Satan, over disease, and, and over sickness. So Mark is very clear as to the identity of Christ, and Christ is very clear as to the reason for which he came. It's been said that his ministry was so powerful that ne nearly every disease was banished in the land of Israel during the three years or so that he ministered. But let me remind you once again from the words of Jesus that that is not the reason why he came. Two foundational verses for us, chapter 1, verse 38, he said to them, Let us go to the next towns that I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. Of course, we saw the content of that preaching in chapter 1, verse 15, when he declared the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. Also, a foundational verse uh, from the book of Mark in chapter 10, verse 45, for even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. The New Testament only gives two instances where lepers were healed. One is here in our text. The other is found in Luke 17 regarding ten lepers who were healed with only one of them thanking God. 
But I think what we have here this morning is, is really a, a summary or a representation of, of all the lepers that Jesus ever healed. And we want to consider the spiritual meaning, not just the physical and temporal meaning of his healing here this morning. Again, no doubt Jesus healed many, many lepers, but, but our passage is focused on one individual. And, and it suffices to say that each and every individual that was healed by Jesus had, had a deeply emotional and a personal connection. So if we can think for a minute about one man in great need here this morning. But as I've already said, we need to look beyond the physical healing to the underlying spiritual meaning. It took the reading of, of, of different books and, and meditating and praying on this for me to realize that this serves more than just an example of Christ's healing power and his authority over sickness. It really serves as, as an example or an analogy of the salvation that Jesus brings and the cleansing of sinners. And so this is a gospel passage. The healing of this leper serves as a powerful analogy of salvation. It points us to the cleansing power of Christ our King. The one who can clean, cleanse us from all defilement and restore us to a right relationship with God. So I want to begin this morning considering the cross we got to realize something, that Christ went to the cross and he was treated like an outcast so that those who were truly outcast could be treated like children in the sight of God. So let me begin, first of all, with an incurable disease. An incurable disease. Verse 40, a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. In Luke chapter 5, verse 12, Luke says that this man was full of leprosy. And so although that term was used about, uh, regarding a lot of skin conditions at that time, this was, this was Hansen's disease. It's a modern name for it. This man was full of leprosy, and in saying that, it's saying that it affected every part of him from his head all the way down to the bottom of his feet. He was covered with leprosy. Hansen's disease is a communicable disease that can travel through the air or by touch and is one of the most feared diseases in the ancient world. If you got it, it was a death sentence. And not to get into the gory details, but it is a spongy tumor-like swellings around the face, the body. It affects the internal organs. It affects the bones. They just start to deteriorate. It weakens the victim's immune system, makes them susceptible to other diseases like tuberculosis. If you've ever seen a picture of someone with leprosy, it's not a pretty sight. Their bodies, their body's warning system is destroyed. Their ability to feel pain and their central nervous system is attacked. In other words, this person cannot feel pain. So they couldn't feel a, a hot pan that they might pick up. They, they couldn't feel a nail that they would step on. They could not feel if they were walking on shattered glass, for example. They, they had the inability to feel pain. The body's warning system that, that this is hot and don't touch it was, was shut off through this disease. And so I used to think that, that it was something that afflicted their body where their, where their hands would, would melt away or decay. But it was really an effect of being overused and being wounded time and time again that, that you would often see that they would have like nubs or stubs for appendages or gross disfiguration simply because they couldn't feel pain. They couldn't feel it and thus they couldn't respond. They, they could work so hard that they would do damage to their hands and, and, and even worse, again, not to get graphic, it, in the third world varmints could, could feed on them in their sleep and they wouldn't even know it. Now, J.C. Ryle, which is, who's so helpful, he said, this is a disease which is utterly incurable. It is no mere skin disorder, as some ignorantly suppose. 
It is a radical disease of the whole man. It attacks not merely the skin, but the blood, the flesh, the bones, until the unhappy patient begins to lose his extremities and to rot by inches. Let us remember besides this, that among the Jews, the leper was reckoned unclean and was cut off from the congregation of Israel and the ordinances of religion. He was obligated to dwell in a separate house. None might touch him or minister to him. I think we get a full picture of this individual's desperate situation. The leper, although he couldn't feel pain, he knew he was sick. All we'd have to do is look at his body and he would see that he was incurable. Furthermore, they emitted a foul odor because of the rotting tissue. They would look at their bodies. They would see decay. They would be ostracized from society. They would be cut off from religious observance. They were considered cursed by God. The, the theology of that time thought people were sick because they had sinned against God. In fact, Leviticus tells us much about the way they had to respond. Leviticus 13, God's word says, The leprous person who has a disease shall wear torn clothes and let their hair of his head hang loose, and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, Unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has a disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Now I have to make an immediate correlation. Do you see the picture of sin? Maybe it isn't immediately apparent, but sin affects us from head to toe. Uh, sin goes deep into our central nervous system. It corrupts and it defiles us. Sin shuts off our warning system to the point that if we persist in it, it, it cauterizes our conscience, that we continue to do damage to ourselves, all the while not knowing that we are suffering. Sin makes us unclean before God, and it leaves us open to the wrath of God. Sin affects every one of us, and if unchecked, it makes us fit for destruction. I think about this and I think you can be so caught up in your sin thinking that you're fine when you're being destroyed. You're destroying yourself. And sometimes you look at individuals and it looks like they're absolutely destroying their lives because of sin. And truly in an eternal sense we are, we are destroying ourselves because of our sin. Our sin is leading to death. And it deadens us to the seriousness of the disease. And I don't want to overstate this, and I can't overstate the reality of sin. I really can't. But it's a foul stench to God. And again, it took a lot of reading for me to truly realize the depth of this and the spiritual implications, if you think about it. Unless this leper knew his condition, he would have never went to Christ. And unless you and I understand the seriousness of our sin, we're, we're never going to come to Christ. We're never going to come to him unless we sense our need, unless we're poor in spirit and mourning over our sin. I know most people don't like to think of themselves as unclean and unholy and unworthy. But that's God's own word regarding us apart from Christ. The leper was without hope and without God in the world, and he knew it. So what did Jesus do? He came to Jesus, imploring him and kneeling to him, if you will, you can make me clean. I love the simplicity of Mark. I've said that time and time again. He simply comes to Jesus. First of all, he comes. Right? We, we want to call sinners to Christ. We want to tell people to flee to Christ, to come to Christ. Second, he assumes a posture of humility and reverence. He begs Jesus. Luke says that he was down on his face before the Lord. Third, he acknowledged that he was unclean. And fourth, he trusted that Jesus could make him clean. I see a clear parallel to, to salvation for sinners in this passage and even in my own life. The fact that this leper came to Jesus in a public setting, it certainly would have been shocking to everyone. It was ceremonially, un, he was unclean, it was uncouth, it was unkind, it was, it was shocking, it would violate social norms. But this leper was driven to despair, so he violated all of that and he went to Jesus. I can't, 
I can't think of all the things that keep people from coming to Jesus. I don't, I don't know. I don't have a list, but I've heard excuses before. But, it, but my family, or but my situation, or I don't want to be embarrassed. I don't want to be a, give a testimony of Christ. Whatever it is, whatever it is that keeps us from coming to Jesus, it's, it needs to be done away with. This leper, he cast everything aside because of his need. His extreme condition ex- called for extreme action, don't you think? I mean, his desperate plight went to his desperate plea to the Lord, and he begged the Lord to make him clean. And even though his attitude could have, would have been socially unacceptable and shocking to the crowd, it was certainly reverent and respectful to Christ as he comes to him. Luke 5, verse 12 says he fell on his face, he flattened himself in humble reverence to Jesus, recognizing his own unworthiness. The leopard begged Jesus to make him clean. And it seems that he did not presume upon Jesus because he said, if you're willing. And uh, I, I'm concerned for people who presume upon the grace of God so much that they're putting off coming to Christ until they feel like they're ready. And I just hope Jesus is ready. Jesus is not obligated to operate on our whims and on our desires. Yes, all who come to him, he will no wise cast out. But the prerequisite is to understand our condition and understand our situation. There was, there was no... Uh, this, this guy was under no illusion that he was in a good place. It seems he didn't presume upon his grace because he appealed to the sovereign prerogative of God. But at the same time, he expressed genuine faith that Jesus could make him clean. What a glorious picture of salvation. Can you imagine the crowds that day? Shocked, disgusted, horrified at the sight of this leper, this man full of leprosy, going out to Jesus in front of all the crowds. They were probably shouting, don't touch him, Jesus. He's unclean. He's unclean. I don't know if the man shouted unclean or unclean. It would be obvious that he was a leper. But they would be probably shouting, don't touch him. Don't touch him. He's unclean, all the while not realizing that they were unclean. They were the ones that were unclean. Not just the leper. Again, J.C. Ryle, I make no apologies. He's so good, so helpful. There is a foul soul disease which is ingrained in our very nature and cleaves to our bones and marrow with deadly force. That disease is the plague of sin. Like leprosy, it is a deep-seated disease affecting every part of our nature, our heart, will, conscience, and understanding, memory, and affections. Like leprosy, it makes us loathsome and abominable, unfit for the physician, and is slowly but surely dragging us down to the second death. And worst of all, far worse than leprosy, it is a disease from which no mortal man is exempt. We all are, as Isaiah says, unclean. I don't know how that resonates with you. I'm not here to insult you. I'm here to preach the realities of the truth of the gospel. What God sees in unrepentant sinners. That we are all victims of an incurable disease. But secondly, we're going to see the Lord's unlimited compassion. Because in verse 41, it tells us that he was moved to pity, or in most translations, moved to compassion. He stretched out his hand, he touched him, and he said to him, I will be cleaned. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. Jesus wasn't made unclean, right? In the Old Testament, it was, they were considered unclean if you touched them. You, you couldn't get within six feet of a leper if you were an Israelite. And if the wind was blowing your way, you had to be 150 feet away, give or take. You, they, they, you would become unclean. But here, Jesus touches the man. Jesus does not become unclean. He's holy and undefiled and unstained. The man becomes clean. Verse 43. Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go and show yourself to the priests and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for proof to them. This idea of the compassion of the Lord is more than just sympathy or or pity. It's a strong word that speaks of like a visceral reaction. In fact, Jesus felt compassion in his guts, if you will, to use a modern term. 
He stretched out his hand. He touched him and he said, I will be clean. Now his word alone would have been enough. But he touched the man and he was clean. Jesus was not unclean. He was clean. And in keeping with Mark's theme, immediately the leprosy left him. Immediately. The divine power of our king over, over sickness and over illness is unbelievable. No recovery, no rehabilitation, no effects of disfigurement that we can tell, no defilement, no despicable scars. And even in the age of medical miracles, nothing comes close to this kind of instantaneous healing that Jesus offered. The effects of his disease were reversed and it was immediately. And so Jesus charges him, go show yourself to the priests, but don't speak about it or tell anybody on the way. And so much ink has been spilled as to why Jesus would do this. Of course, he, they give us, he gives us a reason at the end of verse 44 as a proof to them or as a testimony to the priest. Go show yourself to the priest. Jesus upholds the Mosaic law. Leviticus 14, you can read it for your homework. What had to take place? The offerings that had to take place. The ceremony over a period of days that had to take place before the priest could declare him clean. But I think the motive for Jesus sending him is not only to uphold the Mosaic law, but that this man would be a testimony to them about the power of Jesus and his identity and who he truly was. After all, this guy would be coming back clean. They would have no choice but declare him clean. It would be a proof for them or a testimony to what Jesus has done. And I thought about this and I thought all the religious establishment could do at that time was to notice or declare or see that the man was clean. They couldn't make him clean. All the religion in the world couldn't make this man clean. Only Jesus could make him clean. His power, his authority would be further proof that he is who he said he was. The ceremony would go on in Leviticus 14. It would be undeniable what would happen. And so the man obeys Jesus, but he disobeys him. He obeys him by making his way to the priest, but he disobeys him by telling everyone else along the way. And could you really blame him? Could you, could you really blame him? I had a couple spots of poison ivy this week. I thought I was going to die. I was... I wanted to be healed, you know, instantaneous. I had these horrible skin rashes and nothing like leprosy. But I'm feeling better now and I'm praising the Lord. But could you imagine how this guy felt? He had an incurable disease, but he encountered the, the unlimited compassion and the pity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Time and time again, if you study his miracles, he is moved with compassion. Compassion, compassion. Power, authority, yes, it's all there, but compassion is what drives Christ. He had compassion on the man. So I don't think anybody would blame this man for being so excited. You think about it, he had no interaction with anybody. He would be relegated to a leper colony. He had, he had probably no touch except by another leper, but not that he could ever feel it. I truly believe he felt the touch of Christ. No interaction. He begins to freely talk about it and spread the news everywhere. Where? In the towns. He'd been quarantined from the towns. Now he's been cleaned. What else are you going to do? He goes in and he freely talks about it. And his testimony would be so powerful, so striking, that he would further whip up the frenzy related to Jesus. And so again, much speculation as to over why Jesus said, don't tell anybody. It was simply because... The more the word got out about his healings, the more the people were coming out and pressing in, demanding healings. But then again, Christ says, I didn't really come to do all that. I need to come to preach. So this guy kind of put a monkey wrench in his plans. You remember from Mark 31, Jesus wanted to go to the next towns to preach, and here he was. His popularity was swelling as a result and people were coming out because they wanted the superficial, temporal desires and expectations that Christ could give them. The crowds were excited about the healings. They were coming out to him. They were largely or mostly uninterested in the message. They mostly wanted to receive the temporal benefits or blessings of what Jesus could provide. 
But we'll see as he gets to the message, the crowds dissipate. And it's the message that's central. Here we have a leper who started in isolation and after meeting Jesus, he was free to mingle in the cities. Jesus, who began in the cities, meets the leper and he's relegated to the isolated places. We have Jesus who started there and he ends up out there. This man starts out there, he ends up here. And I can't help but thinking about the cross. I can't help but thinking about the exchange that takes place at the cross, how Christ becomes sin for us and we become the righteousness of God. I'm, we are spiritual lepers, if you will. We live in alienation and isolation from God. In order to be saved, Jesus leaves the presence of God. He enters into time and space. He, he comes into our world. And on the cross, he was forsaken. He was made a curse. He was stricken and smitten and afflicted. He was cut off, rejected by men, and cursed by God, and treated as an outcast. So outcasts like us could be treated like the children of God. The, the, the gospel is in clear view. What we need to realize is that we are unclean before a holy God and only Jesus can make us clean. No amount of religion, no amount of ceremony, no amount of ritual. Only Christ can make us clean and he does that by taking our place. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You have an incurable disease, unending compassion, and we have uncontainable joy. Because as sinners, when we come to Christ, Christ makes us clean. And we go and we express our gratitude and our joy and we tell other people about it. Christ died in our place on the cross. He took our afflictions. He bore our sorrows. He hung on the tree and died for me. He, he suffered there alone. He's the only one that can make us clean. And so we sing like we sing this morning, like we sing elsewhere. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise, the glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. You know, you know this line, He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foul is clean. His blood avail for me. Uh, brothers and sisters, friends, I, I want to bring out the cross of Christ and the gospel for you, and I commend it to you this morning. I don't know if you've come to the realization of your uncleanness, if that's even a word, or your unholy nature. It's not just the things we do, it's who we are. We're born in this world in sin, and we sin as a result of it. This disease is incurable. There's no cure except Christ. One out of one people die from sin. And our Lord is full of compassion and mercy, is he not? He took our sins and our sorrows. He made them his very own. He bore our burdens to Calvary and suffered and died alone as an outcast. So that all those of us who are alienated from God can come into relationship with God and be acceptable in his sight and have relationship with one another. This is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, verse 1. If you come to Jesus in that spirit of humility and poverty of spirit, like the leper, if you come truly broken over your sin, or, or perhaps this, I, other people have said they met people like this, and maybe you, you are that person. I haven't met too many. You think, you're so, you think you're so unclean that Jesus can't save you. I have found most people think they're pretty good and don't need Jesus. But there are maybe some of you today that think you've done something so wicked and so egregious that nobody knows about that Jesus can't forgive you and cannot heal you from that and cleanse you. I want you to know that if you come to him in the spirit of poverty and humility, imploring to him and beseeching him, the answer is always the same. I am willing. May I commend the gospel to you this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for our time 
of worship this morning and as we take this brief look into the passage, I pray that we would meditate on this further and see the great and glorious uh, message of redemption and salvation and cleansing that is found in Jesus na Jesus name Heavenly Father I pray that you would be so working in the hearts of the people here this morning that they would see their need of Christ continually see their need of Christ and continually go to him not only for cleansing from the penalty of sin but also cleansing from the power of sin and and one day we will be delivered from the presence of sin once and for all. Father, I pray that all was said here this morning would be glorifying to you. And, and again, we pray that our church would be one that is centered on the gospel and, and helping each other come to Christ and seeing our need of him. That's the only requirement that we come, is that we sense our profound need. Help us in that end, Father, we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. We're dismissed.